we are very happy that uh, this afternoon we will be having a baptismal ceremony. This, this year has been a bit quiet, not much going on. We, we are only Zoom here, Zoom there, Zoom, but not so much in the church. But we, we have, uh, you know, members who are still doing things at the back, and we are so thankful that uh, the Spirit of God is still moving and working in the hearts of all our members. We have uh, small groups here and there still running, and uh, through the effort of these small groups, and we have uh, Brother Melvin, uh, who is now you know, getting ready this afternoon to go into the water and be baptized. And this is a very big decision, and it's a very important decision in a person's life. Uh, when we're dealing with truth, we need to make wise decisions. So this is a big step for him, and I pray that uh, with, with this, uh, the Spirit of the Lord will continue to uh, guide him and bless him, and he will be able to uh, accomplish much uh, for the Lord and for other purposes. Our scripture reading says that, that someone, uh, a notable, uh, a teacher, a rabbi, uh, a ruler, part of the uh, Jewish uh, San, uh, Sanhedrin, and he came to Jesus by night. It, it makes me wonder why. Why did this uh, individual come to Jesus by night? And in John chapter 3, verse 3, we have just read. This is a very important verse. It says, Jesus answered and said to him, and this king is Nicodemus. Nicodemus, somehow, he, uh, he was hold, holding that position. Uh, perhaps at that time, he was not, not uh, willing to expose him himself as, as a disciple of Jesus. But when I, when I read Ellen White in uh, The Desire of Ages, I found out that when, when Jesus, when uh, he was crucified, and then two persons, and one of them was Nicodemus, and he was, he was helping to bring the body of Jesus down and to bury Jesus. And you can see that uh, he was also helping Jesus in other ways, even before he uh, publicly uh, made known that uh, I'm a disciple of Jesus. He, he even helped Jesus, you know, time and again uh, through his uh, influence as a member of the Sanhedrin. So, according to what I read, he says that uh, he was actually waiting and he was actually helping Jesus even before that. But one night he came to Jesus and he, and he raised this question about, about life. But uh, he was raising this question in his heart. But Jesus, being God, Jesus knew. And Jesus went directly to answer that question in his heart. So verse 3 says, Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again. Unless one is born again. So it means that uh, there, there, there is no other way. This is the only way. Unless one is born again. And it goes on by saying that he cannot see the kingdom of God. If this is the only way that we need to be born again, please tell me how to go about it. How to go about it that I can be born again. So Nicodemus wanted to know. He was uh, knowledgeable, being a teacher, and yet he went by night to see a, a young teacher by the name of Jesus. And uh, he spoke to Jesus. 
this is something that I have been thinking about. How can I do it? And here in verse 4, it says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Can a person be born again by going back to the mother's womb? Of course, it's a bit laughable. And we, we think that you, you are crazy, Nicodemus. You are a teacher, and yet you raise this kind of question. But he must have thought, thought that if it is crazy to do it physically, how is it possible to do it spiritually? If physically is hard, spiritually should be harder. How is it possible that, that someone can be born again? And Jesus, by saying that, he's telling Nicodemus, you want to go to the kingdom of God. You want to enter the kingdom of God. I'm telling you for the first time that unless you be born again. And then in verse 5, he's saying again the second time. Verse 5, Jesus is saying here, Jesus answered most assuredly. It's a very strong word, most assuredly. Verse 3, he says, unless. Now he says, most assuredly. That means you, you, you definitely have to do it this way. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And now Jesus is, is pointing out the way to be born again spiritually. That is, to be born of water and the Spirit. And this is very important. It's not just water, but water and the Spirit. Then, you see here, verse 6, and Jesus is emphasizing here. And Jesus says, That which is born of the flesh is flesh. The flesh is carnal. So that which is born that is carnal is carnal. And then it says here, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit or spiritual. If you're born of the spirit, you become spiritual. We have this body and this body comes to this world with us, whether we like it or we don't like it. Sometimes I look at my own inner body, what's wrong after so many years? More than 60 years, you are still the same. No, no uh, growing outward. But it's like that. Whether you like it or not, this is the body that God has given you. And this body that God has given us has a nature. And this is the sinful, carnal nature that comes with this body through our first birth. Because from our parents, if you move upward and upward and upward, we all actually came from Adam and Eve. So that sinful nature came all the way down. So we, we like it or not, we believe it or not, we are all born that way. We are just born as sinners. We don't have to be taught to sin, to do wrong. Automatically, we know how to do it. Because that sin, that sin is already inside the baby, even before the child is born, is already there. It has that seed. And that will develop and grow. So with that first birth that we have from Adam, we are, we are not holy. We are sinful. And we cannot come to the presence of the Holy God. So we cannot enter heaven that way. So there must be another way out. And if there is a way that is easy, then we do not need this way. This, this way is very hard. If there's an easier way, right? 
But this way is the only way. And this is the best way. And this is the way that Jesus says. You have to have it. If you don't have it, you cannot enter the kingdom of God because you are already born of the flesh. And the flesh is automatically doing the works of the flesh. But you need something else that's different. That's to be born of the Spirit. That's why it says here that you must be born of water and the Spirit. The Spirit is so important. And verse 7, for the third time, Jesus is saying, Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. Wow! Saying born again three times to this professor by the name of Nicodemus. You should understand Nicodemus. If you retain just your, your flesh, fleshy nature, you will not be able to enter the kingdom of God. You need to be born again of the Spirit. And that's why it's so important that we be baptized. And when, when we baptize a person, we usually raise the hand up, right? And ministers, they have all kinds of pattern, all kinds of style of doing it, see? But the real thing that we need to understand is that this is actually the laying of hand. It's the laying of hand. You don't put up there, but it's actually laying of hand. So you are praying, when we lay hand, we are, we are praying that the Spirit of God must help this person. That's, that's the most important part. Otherwise, you, the, the person will be going inside the water just to have a swim, take a shower, that's it. So the spirit must enter that person, must enter the heart of that person to give that person a new nature. And this is important to have that spirit. And this we cannot do. And that's why Jesus before he left, he promised that, that the Spirit must come. Unless the Spirit comes, we cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's so important. So you see in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, Verse 5. Okay, I'll read to you. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. Here it says, It says, For, truly, uh, for John truly baptized with water, but you shall be, shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So, baptizing with the Holy Spirit is important. So, when a person is baptized, put the person into the water, you can see the minister usually raises his, 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 his hand. But we must understand this is a symbol of, of baptizing the person with the Holy Spirit. So, when a person is baptized with the water, it goes with the Holy Spirit, symbolically. And the one who is baptized is right away receiving. And by faith, he is receiving the Spirit. And this is so important. Because unless this takes place, there's no new birth. The new birth is born of the Spirit. Now, I will read to you from Psalm, Psalm 51. Psalm 51, you, you see here that King, King David, he wrote this psalm. And he wrote this psalm after he sinned. After he sinned, he committed adultery. And here he was crying. Actually, he was crying. He repented. And here in uh, Psalm 51, verse 10, here it says, Create in me a clean heart, 
The heart. With the first birth, the heart is not clean. Create in me a clean heart. I cannot, I cannot have this clean heart. And I have no power to clean this heart. But you can create. When God created this world, He made it perfect. So God can create a clean heart, a heart that is new. And here it says, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. And verse 11, do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. David knew. If you take the Holy Spirit from me, there's no way I can have this clean heart. So to be a Christian, to be able to have this clean heart and to maintain this clean heart, we need the Holy Spirit. It's so important. That's why Jesus, before he left, he said, I pray the Father that he sent another another helper or another comforter or counselor. That is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. In John chapter, chapter 14, verse 16, he mentioned that. And, and here you see that in Luke chapter 11, you see the, uh, the, the language here that Jesus is using. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. And here the comparison. The comparison here is, verse 13, If you then, being evil, you being evil, that's talking about us, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? So, how to have the Holy Spirit? Without the Holy Spirit, you don't have a new heart. You don't have. You cannot produce. If you, if you put a seed that is, uh, 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 you know, uh, papaya, you put it in the ground, what do you get? The fruit of a papaya tree. That's it. You, you will not get something else. That's the law. So what fruit are we bearing? If we have just the sinful nature, we will bear the fruit that is not, not perfect. But if you want to bear the fruit of the Holy Spirit, you need the Holy Spirit. And that's why it's so important that Jesus is saying, if evil fathers are evil too, and I know how to give good things to my children, I have three children, and they are also born like us. They choose things that are not, not right. And as a father, I say, no, 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 don't, don't take, you take this one. And sometimes we argue, we, we, we even, oh, not happy, your kids, they, they want, I say, no, 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 you, I give you the good one. This is the best, this is better for you. Don't, don't take that. But no, no, I want that. This is a, the, the flesh wants that. So it is like that. So God is, is so excited. Here he says, how much more if evil parents know how to give? How much more your heavenly father know how to give the best, the best gift? We only need one gift. Only one gift. If we have this one gift, we will have all the others. That's why Jesus says, I pray the Father that He will send this one to you. And how to receive this one gift? So simple. Ask. Ask. Just pray and ask. Do we pray to God and ask for the Holy Spirit? Maybe we ask for many things. All the things that we like, all the things that we want. And we live out the best, the Holy Spirit. And in order to have the Holy Spirit, it's very simple. So you ask. 
If you ask, you have it. You know the psalmist? Psalm 63, verse 1. 63 verse 1 says, O oh God, you are my God. Early will I seek you, for my soul thirsts for you. My flesh longs for you in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. Can you see the language here? The psalmist, huh? he was thirsting, thirsting for God, thirsting for God. And all we need is to have that same kind of passion, that same kind of thirst for God. And if we ask, if we seek God this way, so if you ask, you know, sometimes we don't feel thirsty, but we need water. We don't feel it. But we still need to drink. And we drink a little bit. You drink a little bit, so life is like that. But this, this guy here, this you know, Simon says, I, I, I want to drink a lot. I want to drink more. If we have this kind of desire like the psalmist, we pray and say, God, give me more. Fill, fill my heart with your spirit. Fill it up to the brim. And then, you see, we have the gifts of the Holy Spirit and the fruit of the Holy Spirit.